So how, what's the structure for this thing? Well, I, th I thought just it, it was great <laughs> seeing the show, and you were amazing. Yes, well done. Yes. Well done. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Perfect lead off. I, I, I should just say, an additional awkwardness is I loved everything about what just happened, and I feel completely sort of, I, I'm not quite sure what to say. Yeah, it's sort of and now I'm going to randomly sort of talk about, about you know, music and plays or something, but it feels like I just saw a really good example of it, so I don't, I don't know why I know well, anything about it. Taking off from what we saw, yeah. which was so interesting a combination of music and melodrama, and using all the theater arts to amplify the story, um, I just thought we would talk a little bit about how. In all the different forms, as, as Raphael was saying, Nico's worked in a lot of different forms. I, also ballet, you've, you've composed a lot of ballets. Yeah. And, and there's a notion, I think, particularly in film music, people talk about, oh, you know, the director's gonna tell the composer, uh, we need to make them feel something here so that they get it and so they feel it, you know? And, and I, I, I thought, when thinking about this talk, that that's probably not something I would guess that you would subscribe to, the idea that the role of music or that the goal of music in any of these dramatic forms is to, you know, to make somebody, you know, to hold them down and hold them right. hostage. Well, but I think that's, that's sort of what we were dealing with in the, in the, in the second half of this, of this play, is, is, is the idea, that, um, the idea that, that manipulation is at the heart of anything that you see on stage, and that, and that, the, that music is, is one way to, that you can do that. Stagecraft is another way you can do that. There, you know, there are a variety of, sort of, of of lies that you could tell, which is essentially what you're doing, right? And that's and what's what's was so fascinating about tonight uh, was that the, that music functioned on every possible level. It it functioned as background. It functioned as traditional underscoring. It functioned as what I would what I would say is like an ironic distance from. It functioned as a comedic sort of element. Um, it functioned as um, you know it was newly composed things. Things that that were you know there was like Mary J Blige or whatever, um, so there's a sense that music was doing everything it could possibly do, and in every in every variety of manipulation, so every variety of um, you know I will compel you to feel this way because for instance the cello all of a sudden is using all these sort of 21st century 20th century techniques rather than rather than what I would call the sort of ironic distance you know traditional thing that was that was a magical moment right all of a sudden you're like you're like so and it's like okay now we're now we're the, the music belongs to a different space and a different time and in a piece so about like idiosyncratic things and multiple registers happening simultaneously right where you have what feels like improvised dialogue on top of sort of shakespearean dialogue on top of whatever um Anyway, sorry. Well, well, Did I answer your yeah, question? No, that's very good. And, and what amazed me is that the idea that, oh, come, 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 come. If, unless I was missing it, that you could have more than one thing happening at the same time. Right. That you could have an ironic distance and then suddenly feel like, oh my god, that cello is making me feel some deeper feeling on top of or in addition to the ironic distance or the laughter or whatever. And uh, how hard is that to achieve? As a, as a goal. Well, I think I think it's probably the hardest thing to do because the da the danger of, of ironic music for me and for, for me the the absolute the, the thing that, that makes my skin crawl the the most is a Prairie Home Companion. <laughs> uh, I can't be in a space in which it's being played. Uh, like people try to put it on the car and I'll like crash the thing. It's because that that is music only used used ironically, right? Where it's like everything is pastiche, everything is meant to. Be, meant to represent something else, everything is meant to be this kind of, you know, and, and the way that people react to that music is with what I, what I call NPR laughter, which is a smug and knowing, muffled. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's the danger of, of having music function ironically, is that. And what, what was amazing about this is, for instance, in the, what I would call the rabbit music, um, that music was actually quite beautiful and simple. And it didn't feel like it was doing that sort of Scooby-Doo cartoon thing, which is very easy to do with a plug cello, that you can, you can end up feeling like we're, we're meant to be in on a joke um, that you know, on, only three years at Vassar can, can uh, prepare you for. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. <laughs> and I, you know, I, th I think you know, may, may the, the argument is that sort of romantic music, and, and I'll make the comparison to sort of melodrama, um, Compels you to, to compels everyone to feel the same way at the same time. I think the the fun of going to see a romantic piece of music or a romantic opera, particularly if you go see Puccini, what you're what you're paying for is a very specific emotional thing that's going to happen to you over four hours, um, which tends to be, you know, it's romantic music for me always always feels like sort of Law and Order, where it's like you know exactly at the halfway point she's going to die, 
right? And then exactly like three, you know, you know when the weeping moments are, and you know when the, the heart clutching moments are. It's kind of about surrender in a way. You surrender, right? Yeah. Whereas with something like this, you actually are are you're invited to feel a lot of different sorts of, sorts of ways, including uncomfortable, mm. including you know, um, you know, it, there's there's a there's a way in mm. which if you actually know what you're meant to be feeling, then the piece has failed. Right, you can all, you're in a, in a constant simultaneity of... Right, engaging on all different levels right. and all that. And like, are we supposed to be laughing? Like... But that's not, the, that's not the usual kind of mindset in most, for a film, taking film just for example, that, that you're asked to, um, an audience is asked to operate on most films. And as a, and as a composer for film scores, how, how, have you ever been asked to do that kind of simultaneity thing? Yeah, I will. I, so I, I did the film. I did the score for a movie called The Reader, which is um, uh, sort of about I would say about two things. It's a relationship between an older woman and a, and a young boy, um, and she's probably a war criminal of some of some sort. Um, and then there's this sort of sub narrative of her finally at the end of her life overcoming some deep childhood shame which is that she was actually illiterate and therefore she couldn't have been as bad of a war criminal as she was being accused of being. Um, and the climax of this film, the sort of emotional climax, is this moment where she finally learns to write her name and it's, kind of, it's a little bit of a miracle worker moment which is what we called it, the, the miracle worker shot. And the danger of that moment was actually really complicated because you, you're being, at, in, in that case, it feels like you want to hit it with something, right? And any time you gave it any sugar, any sweetness, any anything, you're essentially saying, it's okay that maybe she killed those Jews that one time because adult literacy is really important. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it, it was really crazy. It was like, it, it, and, you, and you found yourself completely mortified. And then if you, then if you did nothing, right? If you, if you didn't touch it with anything and the music just sort of washed over the moment, the, it felt like you were saying to the audience, it felt like you were holding the audience in a sort of contempt where you were saying, you're saying there's nothing redeemable about this thing, and so that moment. And when I say a moment, I mean literally four frames of film. It's like, you know, and then it's over. It's I tried everything, and it was like, you know, if you if you put a harp on it, it's it's you know, to yeah, it, it's disnified. If you put you know a, a viola, it sounds like we're making some weird commentary on on you know melancholy and and also adult literacy. It was horrifying, um, always because you're you're being asked to create. A more, uh, an emotional ambiguity, um, and it's it's a really scary thing as a composer because you know that you have the ability to do it so wrong, um, and there's so many options that are just the wrong ones available to you. And finding the right one is the hardest. Do you really thing. have to just experiment? Yeah, you have to do you have to do it wrong a million times. And I had I had the I had the the sort of luxury of um, at that time I was working with Stephen Daldry, the director, um, and he con confesses to being very ignorant about music. He, I mean, he claims. Um, and so the, the notes that I got from him were in two categories, which were successful and not successful. <laughs> and that was, that was as far as we went. It was never the Siskel a, and Ebert school. Yeah, yeah. which I, I still apply to, I mean, you know, even if you're, deal, if you're dealing with an opera, you think successful or not successful yeah. is actually a really good, a really good thing. You know? So you had to walk a tight, really a tightrope mm. in that score because of the in, sort of moral ambiguity of the story. In other films, maybe it's clear what's going on with the right. characters, and you're, you might be called upon. Or, in, for instance, in a theater piece like The Glass Menagerie, which you were just nominated for a, uh, some like a drama, drama desk or something? Desk award today. Which I didn't yeah. even know that that was a thing. Yeah, that was big. So uh, <laughs> that, is, that is a story that perhaps wears its heart more on its sleeve. And not that it's not complex, right. but there are a, you are called upon as an audience member, and the creative team is called upon to present you know, a kind of a direct line to the audience, right. uh, audience's emotions. Well, the challenge, the challenge of that, of, of the glass menagerie that, that I, my, my tactic through that was, the, the question I always ask myself in collaborative musical situations is, to what space does the music belong? I can't, I'm not nearly clever enough to do kind of, to what character does the music belong, where it's like in this Wagnerian way where this person gets this instrument, whatever. That's, that's all very... That's, that's way above my pay grade, I think. Um, so it, what I always worry about is, is again, what, to which room of the house does the music belong? Where is the music coming from? And in a play, especially in, this, especially in these sort of Tennessee Williams thing, things, I always feel like the, the big antagonist in that, in that play is not mom, but the house. It's the apartment that they can't get away from. It's the, it's the memory of the larger space and of the, of the cotton fields and of the 
of the um, what is she? She's always one of the flowers. Yeah, the um, great sound. The jungle. Jungle. She's talking about jungle. Um, and so the, so the idea is that the, actually the, the score that I wrote belongs to the the home, the, the the apartment where they live. And that way, you free yourself from having to make kind of large emotional <laughs> decisions. And and you avoided the obvious choice of um, period stuff. Pastiche, this, you know, referencing the, the period. Right. You took a very kind of timeless approach. How did that? How did you come to that approach? And what was the well, the problem, the problem with doing things period, and this is again, I want to say, like one of the things that I thought was so successful about this is that, is that, you got the sense that it was a, it was a combination of knowing exactly what, knowing exactly what's going on, both on the on from playwright, director, and the actors, um, and also not giving a shit, which is a great combination. <laughs> Of saying we're just going to combine periods, like for instance, you know, the the when when they made it rain, the money is actually seems like it's been subject to art direction, and you know, research like historically, aged. you know, the, I thought the 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 props were you know, but then then also everyone's playing a million roles, and we're doing this sort of fun thing of not of not really being precise about costuming, about you know, the the piece of the piece of weave hanging out of her hair, is like specifically not period, but it doesn't matter. But we know it, but we don't know it. But it's not NPR laugh. It's just like it's a good, it's a good combination. And it's it's hard with period. You know, I, I feel like the, one of, one of the things that drives me insane is if you watch a movie that's meant to take place in like ancient Greece or something, and the score is just symphony orchestra. You're like, why? Why? Seriously, <laughs> seriously, why? Like, what? What? Like, you know, it's just money, right? It's so much money that you can spend. Like, what? What would prevent you from scoring? You know, and I get I get it because I, I get that we that we sort of associate symphonic music with feeling a certain type of epicness, but I've never quite understood I've never quite understood looking at something and then seeing music with an image or with a, with a play when the musicians involved in making that sound couldn't fit in the room that you're in. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. it's like if you're if you're watching if you're watching a play with two people in it, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's an orchestra. You think well. Where are they? Where do they sit yeah. in the room? It's the, it's the Mel Brooks high anxiety moment where he's in the car and there's the tense driving music right. and the bus goes by with an entire symphony orchestra. On the bus <laughs> <and> he's, <laughs> yeah, right. No, exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, the, geni the genius of, of, of things like that is sort of is you know you can get away with it if if it's set in like space, <laughs> Middle Earth, um, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple. Of, but but when when things are in you know I don't know there's some, there's always, something that always drives me a little a little crazy when. We just decide that orchestra is the default. Mm. I think that you know the, the things that the things that get really exciting with it are, you know, what we saw tonight, for instance. Like it didn't have to be a cello. There was no reference of a cello and thing. It just happened to be that that was the restriction, right? The music belongs to this one instrument. And you have to do everything with it, um, which I love. It's a great challenge. It's a great kind of, you know. So can those restrictions, budget re restrictions, or space restrictions, be useful? I think so. Yeah, I think it's it's much more exciting to it's much more exciting to have to be limited than than the weird thing about making music for movies is that they really do have so much money, mm. and the, I mean the amount of the just it's like more zeros at the end of what you're used to being paid, mm. and you know, not not that it goes to you but it goes to the, the budget just to you know the the woman who books orchestral players in London has a pair of boots that cost more than anything I will ever own. Do you know what I mean? Like, they, 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 these people are paid. Isabel. <laughs> Isabel, exactly. Honorary Isabel, this boots. woman's boots, I, they drive me crazy. <laughs> it's like, uh, I aspire to, to such to a Just to go back to The Glass Menagerie, just because I'm obsessed with that incredible score and that incredible production. What, what were the conversations like? Because this is a production that you probably a lot of you have seen that's not the traditional production, that's set in this sort of dream space that it's just a different approach to the play than is usually done. What, what were the discussions with John Tiffany like? We, we decided that the music wanted to sound like it was infinitely there. So basically, if you, did, if you haven't seen it, the, the whole set is these little pods, um, and it's, they're suspended in a sort of black liquid, a pool. a pool of, and so you can't, there's no way to get on the stage except through stairs from below and above. Um, and the idea is that, the, that you know, they're always sort of at the edge of falling in. And there was always at the edge of this kind of, of this, you know, what, what feels like it could be an infinite pit of despair or loneliness or whatever. So we decided that the music always wanted to feel like it was emerging from that and going back into that. And yeah. that when you heard the music, it wasn't like, this is a cue that is precisely 15 seconds long that bridges this to this to cover up, like, the, moving the candelabra on. 
it it was almost like you it had always been there, and then you just happened to notice it for a mm. second, mm. and then it and then it went back in. When you've made a decision like that, it changes the whole thing because you you don't have to write these fussy little cues, but instead you have to create this kind of dreamscape that they can dip in and out of at will. So does that mean instead of a, a really structured cue that has a real sense of beginning, middle, and end with a button at the end, right. you had a oh god, a button is the worst. But people love a button in theater. I don't know what that is. It's like it, you know, meaning. Meaning it's like the, the scene changes, then it's like. <laughs> it's so, and I, it actually drives me crazy. It's like when you when you go see musicals, every transition, yeah. it's like you think that's not actually a transition. It's almost like begging the audience for something in a weird way. It's right. So well, I think I, I mean I think you know there's something there's something great about if you see like a really expensive show and it's like things are on knives and shooting around the stage and then everything lands perfectly in the middle and then you know the woman comes and grabs the flowers right from the machine that pops it. It's, you know there's something cool about that in the same way that like you know those those. Um, those perpetual motion machines, Goldberg yeah. kind of things. Um, but once you've once you've said the music is drones, the music is atmosphere, the music it, the music belongs to a pool of liquid. Um, it's much more it's it's freeing and also kind of stressful uh, because then you, you 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 can't do anything you can't do anything character related. You can't say you know you can't you can't say whenever whenever he. Whenever Tom starts look, sort of looking into the thing, we're going to put like an English horn or something that's going to is going to be heard. You have to say. Now in the, in in opera, mm. is it is there is it any different? Because there the music is so foregrounded compared to the sort of more supporting role on play. Does what kind of pressure does that put on you to to push push your game forward? Yeah, I, well with with opera, I I mean I I have to say you know I've, I've written two of the things. I still almost I, I I'm definitely still learning how to do it. It's really hard, um, and you're in a constant similar state of negotiating. What is the desired emotional outcome? And the best you can do with opera, I think, is project the right emotional options to the audience. I, I, I don't know that anymore we have, any, we have any business like insisting that people feel a certain way at a certain time. Um, that, to me, feels like a very 19th century mode. Um, and so you picked a very ambiguous story, just to, in a, the most bare thumbnail way of describing it, the plot of two boys. It's a little boy gets stabbed and it turns out that he was involved in some shit online mm -hmm. and was maybe the author of his own stab. Dot com. <laughs> um, and it's, it, it's the job of, isn't this your job to do Yeah, I know. Really. It's like, <laughs> <why> <laughs> is it literally I have my, my long version <laughs> in my head and I suddenly thought, wow, I can't make and then there's, there's, a, there's a, police, a police woman who has to sort of solve this um, and she's a creature of the analog world and all she understands are sort of the analog emotions that people feel and has to figure out how kids essentially are, kids and adults are using the internet um, to lie to one another in an exciting way. So there is a lot of ambiguity, there is a lot of mystery and things that aren't resolved until right. a certain And point. nobody's like evil. That's the crazy thing also in, in romantic opera is that people can be evil. Like a, like a bad guy comes on and it's like trombones. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and there's, there's no sense of like, you know, and I think with a lot of with, these, with modern stories, especially with ones that involve children, it, it's, it's very difficult to insist that, what, that a thing is a certain way. So the way that I said about writing that opera was to, again, have the music belong to environments. So you have this boring music that belongs to the police station. You have this ecstatic, sexy, confusing music that belongs online that if you, if you look at it one way, it's kind of this shimmering thing. If you look at it another way, it turns into this slightly menacing presence. Um, and then you have, and then you have legit emotions told to, in real space mm. between two human beings. I should do a side note that Nico composed uh, like five chunks of music, interludes that depicted the these teenagers online, in which the set, the stage just comes alive with a chorus singing this incredibly alive, shimmering. Uh, everybody singing different words all at the same time that, to, that represented the idea of the people on the internet. And there were some of the most thrilling parts of the opera because it's, it took something that you know, we experienced by ourselves in our room and exploded it and really captured that sense of zooming back and seeing yeah. that people are doing this everywhere and it's, it's vibrant and alive and exciting. And terrifying. Yeah. And, ter and I, I, I just remember you know, being, I'm 32 now, and it was like the, fir the first time you signed into like AOL chat or whatever the fuck it was. It was really scary. It was really like it, 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 it was a feeling of sort of vertiginousness and so again, it's like the music doesn't want to belong to the author, to the author or to the to the user. The music belongs to the environment. 
Um, you just to just to not neglect ballet. Mm. I mean, that's a that's a thing in which the music is certainly not in the background right. by any means. Uh, what are those conversations like with a with a choreographer? I mean, ballet music is weird <laughs> because you know, I I, lear I learned a couple years ago that people who go to the ballet really music is like a tertiary concern, right? They're like. They're like, was that girl's arm really thin or was it like really, really thin, <laughs> right? There's a real like obsession with the, with the bodies and the music could be, you know, it could be really nothing. <laughs> a lot, most people would be fine. Does that mean you're freed a bit from a, a pressure of storytelling yeah. and emotional? I've, I have found that this, is, that this is true. I've also resisted ever doing a narrative ballet because um, again, I feel like I'm not quite sure what that means. I much prefer the abstraction of, of saying this isn't about anything. It's about shapes. It's about bodies. It's about reacting to, and dancers are, are amazing because they have to they have to learn the music so much better than we have to write it, and they, they learn it in this obsessive tactile way that has absolutely nothing to do with the score. Um, one of my favorite things to do to, when you go to a ballet rehearsal is you listen to them counting, and it's as if I mean they're counting in a completely different way than the actual music looks, and it's an amazing thing. They're inscribing their own body shit onto my score. Um, so we, so for me with ballet, the fun of it is that you say. You know, with, with Benjamin Milipier, who I've worked with a million times, right now we have it down to a, a really fast science, um, and we can do the whole thing over dinner. And you, you basically say, what is the structure of the thing? How many bodies are on stage at each time? That's really the only thing I need to know. Um, because one of the things I love about Benjamin is that if he has three people on stage, he'll do everything you can possibly do with three people on stage in these little mini quick narratives, right? <coughs> if the whole core is on stage, he'll do everything you can possibly do with them. He's a very... He's a very sort of abundant. Mm. Maximizing. Maximizing, yes. exactly. And with a duet, with it, with it, I mean, he's, he's, I think, I, you know, choreographers, I think, live and die by their, by their pas de deux. And now I know kind of what, that I can sort of, I can experiment mm. with, with music for two, for two dancers. And I know that he'll react to it in really exciting ways. And that's the, that's the sort of collaborative partnership that's incredibly rewarding. And I've, I've been incredibly lucky because I know that people, other people who work in dance are in, are always fighting each other, <laughs> and I don't think I don't think we've ever had so much of it's a cross word. So, um, it's but it's hard because dancer, you know, chore choreographers are in it not necessarily for the same reason that you are mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, and you like musical structure and dance structure are, are two very different things. Um, so their it, heads are just in a different place. Yeah, and, and I think agree. and the, but the more musical choreographer you have, the more fun you the more, mm -hmm. you know, and and the long I, I think also the longer you work with someone, the more you learn their learn their ways. Mm -hmm. I think with Benjamin too, it's like he, I think because he spent so much time as a dancer, dancing in narrative ballets that his own work resists that so deliciously. It goes the other way. So right now he's in Paris making a Daphne and Chloe, which is like, you know, pretty supremely narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and then the minute he's done with that, we're going to make a big messy piece that has no, no story at all, just to, yeah, thank yeah. God, right? <laughs> um, just to go back to the emotion thing, the, the juggling and cueing and massaging of emotion. Were there things that you just had to you know, pick up along the way in terms of your toolbox for doing that? For all the things we, sh we started out talking about, the different levels, the simultaneity, the, how much to you know, play under Kate Winslet when she's right. being a uh, you know, morally ambivalent character. Uh, you know, that's, an, uh, that's not something they teach you in conservatory, is it? No, it's totally, you, you have to, I, I think the way to do it is to do it wrong a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. um, and to, it's, it's, not, it's not ever taught. And in fact, you know, the weird thing about being a composer is that you're not taught in any way ever, formally, how to interact with other artists. And that's, that's slowly changing. There's, you know, they're, they're conservatives are making, you, making people do, you know, work with choreographers, for instance. But they never say, you know, collaboration is a really messy, horrible thing. Um, not horrible, but it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult process. And you're basically you're trying to graft one vision of how art works onto another, and sometimes they're, they're incompatible in a great way. And so, you know, it's so part of it is really just learning, is is boiling everything down to what is the task at hand? What are we What are we actually talking about here in this play or in this scene or in this moment? Like, what what needs to get what needs to get delivered? Um, I thought one of, one of the most kind of delicious things about tonight was that there was a moment of tr of really old fashioned musical storytelling. Um, where you were, you were cued to start, right? And you just started, and, and from that moment, there was like, just started on the low C string for about five minutes. It was a single scored thing with all the fighting, all the running around. 
and the siren and the whole thing is going. And, but that's an amazing thing, right? That's a, that's a very clear musical gesture where you say we're going to start from zero in this abstract sort of liminal space and go to full, every, everything that can be done in the cello is being done with a siren. It's a really exciting thing. It's just a, it's a, it, it's a wedge-shaped structure and it's, I assume, the result of a very, a very concise direction. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I was going to say, I assume that uh, the, the director and the composer in conjunction sort of hash that out, you know, to, to come to that right. shape, and and the goal is to whatever to to well, goal is to create, the create a lot of act activity, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, which is and it, it's completely successful that way. Again, in successful, not successful, five hundred successful. Yeah. Check. Play. We've covered film. We've covered theater. Um, when you are composing pieces that are free of those kind of requirements, do some of those elements still play into your work? I. I have the luxury of not really having to having to do that. <laughs> like I, I, I feel like you know, having, doing something that's not collaborative, doing something that's where I mean, the, the model of you know, we are an orchestra and here is a small pile of money and we'll trade you that for a small pile of paper, um, <laughs> is which is essentially what happens. That those things are so fun because you know, once you once you come from fighting a fighting you know with with collaborators and worrying about emotional content, when someone says all you have to do is fill up 12 minutes. Just fill it up with stuff, right? And make it pleasurable. Um, that's, it's, a, it's an enormous gift, I think. Um, and so no, I mean, I, I, you, I, the th but the thing is, working in theater, working, working in collaborative things, teaches you to be a much, a much harsher judge of what works and what, st what doesn't work. There's no, I mean, as you know, making an opera, it's like there's no room to, if it, I mean, we, we had some bad scenes in the opera that got cut, right? And you have to be very brutal with yourself about that. And, mo and, mo and my ability to not, to not care about cutting something comes really explicitly from these collaborative processes, where it's like, if you're looking at it and it doesn't work, you have to say, okay, bye, like, go away. And you can only tell by trying it, right? Right, and you can only tell by seeing it in yeah. space. Yeah. And that's the scariest thing, is that you know, at your desk, everything is awesome, <laughs> right? At my desk, my shit is like really on point. And then you, then you kind of get on a huge stage and there's like an orchestra there, and you think, that doesn't work at all. Like not even a little bit does that work? No, I know exactly. So the, the first and the first time you do that, you think you think you know you start looking into one-way plane tickets. And, <laughs> and, you know. <laughs> so. the, the last thing I'll ask you, just because I, I think it would be interesting for people to hear about that, you you started out working with Philip Glass very early. Yeah. And that obviously would be a, a more unconventional approach to scoring for dramatic works because he's you know a, he's his own person and right. isn't the, isn't the typical film composer, it isn't just that. Um, can you talk about, a little, just a little bit about that experience and the influence of him and, and other people? Yeah, Phil, I mean, one of, the, one of the weirdest things about Philip Glass's music is that you can, you can put it under any activity, right? So if you, and it'll just seem much more important. Yeah. It's the weirdest phenomenon. It's like, if you, if you watch, like, if you, if you watch the news and turn the sound off and just put on like one of the Philip Glass string quartets, you're like, mm. <laughs> it's really good. No, it's totally amazing. And you find yourself, deep. Deep. it's like totally deep. And I think, I, I think there's something about his music because it's so cyclical and it works, it basically works in these big phrases that, that recycle. There's the sense of, there's a sense of when you're watching an image with it, it's both inevitable and um, it, it, it feels like, it feels like watching a, a, an organic process of, of whose ending we already know, right? So it's like a flower goes from a little seed to a thing to whatever to, you know, it's like, it's the, the idea of knowing when the cycle is gonna recycle, um, there's something really satisfying about that. When it comes back. When it comes yeah. back. The, the thing about Philip also is that no one else can do it. People try to imitate him all the time. And in fact, if you watch, if you watch a lot of TV, like, or, or really any, any kind of any advertisements, there's so much fake and it never works. You really do need the real thing in that way. It's a it's a strange thing. It's sort of like toothpaste. You can't buy the weird like CVS bread. It's the, it, um, he's very it's very specific. I'm not sure what it is, but it's some it's something about it that that um, that just always always works. What's crazy about Philip also, and the thing that I learned from him the most the most specifically is he really doesn't care um, if someone says that they don't like it. He's so happy to, to get to throw music away. Mm -hmm. And I I remember the first time I saw him do it, I thought. I thought, 
oh my god, he's so mad. He's so mad right now. He's doing some weird passive aggressive thing. But this director was like, this isn't working. Like he's like, oh no no, no I'll, run, I'll run another one. I thought that it was going to be some whole, but he was he was like, no no no, I'll really go home right now and write another one. <laughs> and so that inspired in you. Oh my god, it was a so happy. Way of thinking about yeah. your craft. No, exactly, because you're taught in, in music school, it's like every thing you do is a precious gem of genius, right? Which of course is the opposite of true. Most things you do are bad, right? And then you'll have like, you'll have like one okay thing, you know what I mean? Um, and, and, seeing, and seeing Philip, you know, with that, at that point, I mean, I, I was like 18 and he was, you know, he was like this, this kind of semi, you know, godlike person. To see him just kind of with this cup of coffee being like, fuck it, we'll just throw it out. I'll write another one. And then you're like, where does that music go? He's like, there's a drawer. <laughs> <laughs> you compared it once to the sort of like the craft guild or something. Well, I, I guess it's like, you know, for, for me, it's like once upon a time, composers were state employees, right? You worked for the church or you worked for the state, or both, because those things tended to be the same thing. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain amount of music that you had to write every week. And I think, you know, Bach is the great example of this. And he, you know, if you, if you want to think that, that religious music is kind of the first theater music, Right, because choral music, sacred music, is music for play, and we all know what's going to happen. Right, that's what's amazing about celebrating the Mass, is it's not a surprise, like, Jesus died, do you know what I mean? Like, that's not, it's not new each Sunday, like, it, um, but what's great about it is that it, it, it's, a, it's a theatrical structure for composers to, to experiment, and because we know what's going to happen, you can go really wild. And so you know, Bach sets, sets, the, sets the passions multiple times, and each one is very, very different emotionally because we know, we know it's up, mm -hmm. right? And so in some places he can focus on the crowd, in some places he can focus on Christ, in some places he can, you know, it's this very theatrical sense mm -hmm. of, but. There's security for us in that. It's right, it? yeah. but there's also, with, when you think about Bach, it's like he didn't have the luxury to go off into the woods and sort of be a, a, a genius and sort of smear himself with essential oils and, you know, whatever. It, it was really, he had like 40 kids running around the house and, and the shit was due. Yeah, like it was, crank it up. Baby. You, had to, you had to crank it out. And I, th I think that model is really, is really um, it's tragic that it's no longer the case. I mean, I would, lo I would love to be like court composer. Like if Michelle Obama wanted me to just like move in, I would just do it in one second. Because work, working for the government would be my absolute. <laughs> like, oh god, I would be so happy. The um, I mean, it's weird. But you know, well, there's a, I imagine there's a, there's a task centricness right. to it that uh, like writing theater music when there's a, there's a goal, there's a job. There's a goal, there's a job. We need we need yeah. this. We need this much. And, and I think composers like, like Philip Glass, who, who enjoys, as, as I do now, sort of the luxury of some of those let's trade money for paper or projects where you can do whatever you want, and then also the, then the rigor of feeling, you know, scoring a film, it's like a good job. You, you get sent a thing, and you're, basically what you're being paid for is your first reaction to, to this, you know, to this piece of, of film. Also amazing, by the way, is if you ever have the opportunity to watch a film without score, you cannot believe how unbearable it is. It's literally, it's like literally physically yeah, unwatchable. Yeah. And so part, so sometimes when I, if I'm being asked to score something, I'll literally just sit at the piano and like just play anything, like literally any other thing, just so there's, because because actors are weird in silence. It's yeah. it's really really odd, and you notice every strange like background thing. It's it's a very kind of, and I think <laughs> if you say today, my go my job is to is to write the music that goes from here to here that solves these dramatic problems, it's a, it's a task. Um, and it either, you, either you do it right or you don't. And there's a, it's, very, it's very easy to tell if you've got, gotten it wrong. <laughs> Excellent. Any questions? Or, yeah. I have just one question. I'm, I'm curious to look at pop music for a second since you've uh, collaborated with uh, lots of greats. Um, is the, the sort of shortness of length of pop music does that say anything about how emotion works, or how do you? That's an interesting question. The, the length of pop songs being b between like three and a half minutes and six minutes. I think you know. I always think that the best example, the the best pop song, or I, I say pop song is the worst. The worst thing. The the, be the best song I can think of that's written in the last hundred years is um, is My Love Is Your Love, the Whitney Houston song, um, because. The only thing she has, she has very little time in which to do this, and the only thing she has is vocal technique and some arrangement to, to, to go. So by the time you get to that second chorus, it's, the, the stakes are higher. And then when, you get, when she doubles it, the stakes are even higher. And there's this, this precipitousness in the very small shape that she's drawn of how the voice is gonna work, right? And, and this is, 
it's the it's the best example. She also sort of does it in Heartbreak Hotel, and I would say equally successfully. You, the, what you what you have to play with is repetition and technique. That's really it. There's there's really not much you can you can do because if you start if you start throwing and thickening and and things, it it starts to feel really artificial. It's like it feels time lapsey. Um, and I think the the best the best songs are just really subtle changes in how things in how things repeat. And that's a, that's a great way to fill three and a half minutes. Like if you, I, another kind of perfect of that is um, Jolene, right? Jolene is perfect in that way. Mm -hmm. Like where she, you know, it's, Jolene has two ramps in it, right? Where she starts with a story and then she gets kind of emotional and then she comes back and says, I had to have this talk with you, right? So they we start again. So it's a two ramp structure. I don't know, there's, there's something very specific about three and a half minutes being, being what you have to play with. I also feel like there's a, there's a thing that's ha that happens now in, in pop music where, where there's, a, there's an instinct to give everything away immediately, um, which I hope, I hope people stop doing. So people <laughs> turn around in their chairs. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly, exactly. No, I, I, but I'm, I'm, I, I feel like Heartbreak Hotel sort of solves all the, all the problems, as does, as does My Love Is Your Love. It, it, it really does, it, it's symphonic in what it does with two little, two little changes in vocal technique. Mm -hmm. It's really good. Minimal gestures. Minim maximum minimal impact. gestures of maximum effect, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Good way to wrap it up. We'll wrap it up. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs>